just waiting for the just waiting for the uh the waiting room to calm down um but thank you all so much for being here and welcome to ccc oer's final webinar of the spring season um exploring open education publishing platforms um my name is Ryan McKinney. I am a professor of theater arts and director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and I'm also a member of the Professional Development uh, Committee for CCC OER. And on behalf of that committee and our Vice President, Laura Beth Larson, um, I want to thank you all for being here today. And I especially want to thank our presenters, who I will introduce shortly. Um, so just a little bit about CCC OER. I know that most of you are familiar with the organization. Um, I see many familiar names that are joining us today. Um, but here are just sort of some of the, you know, revised uh, institutional organizational priorities for CCC OER, which is a organization that I was introduced to a few years ago when I became the open education coordinator at Kingsborough. And for me, it has been such a rich and supportive organization that's really helped me develop my own educational, my own open educational work. So um, lots of offerings, lots of ways to become involved. And if you have any questions, you can certainly reach out to me or you can reach out to Liz or Lori Beth as well. Um, both of our presenters, both of our uh, presentations today are recipients of open education awards um, from last year, and we're so excited to hear about these projects and celebrate their work. But if you have a project that you think is also deserving of an Open Education Award for 2024, you can nominate them up until May 13. And Liz is going to put that link in the chat. Um, but that is how these uh, present these resources got their own awards, right? They were nominated by folks that knew about them. Um, and we encourage you to nominate any projects that you think are worthy of uh, such an award and that others need to know about so that we continue to grow the open knowledge comments. So as I said before, we have two excellent presentations today. One is a solo presentation representing several people that worked on the project and the other is a co-presentation. Um, so our three presenters are Terry Green, who is a senior e-learning designer at Trent University in Canada, and then a co-presentation by uh, my, my colleagues, Paul Ricciardi, who is a fellow theater professor and associate coordinator of liberal arts here at Kingsborough Community College, and Michelle Turnbull, who is a professor, professor of English at Bergen Community College in New Jersey. Um, once again, my thanks to them for being here and for sharing their work with us. Um, we'll, we'll do the presentations back to back and then we will have time at the end for Q&A and some announcements, just some general CCC OER announcements at the end. So Terry is going to start us off. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so Terry can share his. And Terry, thanks so much. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to double check. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. That's a, a paranoia of mine that I'm talking away and no one hears. So good to see some nods. All right, uh, share my screen. And Ryan, do you mind nodding if you can see that? Cool, thank you. All right, let me just move this around. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna just cover the platform press books because I've uh, worked in it a number of times to, um, um, and I've really enjoyed working with it. Uh, I think it does the trick for uh, plenty of open education projects. Uh, it's a uh, ebook creation and publication platform. It's built off of WordPress, uh, off of the open source code that was on uh, WordPress released. And I think um, this third bullet point uh, that it gives you the creative freedom via limitations. I don't want to say Pressbooks has limitations, but I'm thinking of comparing it to if you're going to create a full-on website for an open education project rather than uh, a Pressbook. It's just because some decisions are made for you. It's a 
book. So it's a more of a linear process. It's this, then this, then this. So kind of some decisions are made for you and you can then focus your creative juices on maxing out what you do with that space rather than um, too much choice. And actually that same kind of creative freedom via limitations, I think is what's uh, powerful about the third project at the end there, any book of one's own, which I will get to. Um, but I just want to establish my uh, experience in press books by telling you I've worked on a few different projects in it. Uh, the Open Faculty Patch Book, which was probably 2017 it came out. Uh, that's a um, project that shares the stories of how teachers go about their pedagogy. We put out a list of, of high impact ped pedagogical practices and ask people to pick one and do a write up on their approach to that. And the idea was that if you get enough of that, you have a community quilt of pedagogy that you have something that covers everything from many different um, perspectives. And uh, it was, it did win one of those OE Global Awards. So I, I think it was successful. I'm pretty proud of that project. And then a few years later, and these second two bullet points are two that I will actually cover um, is the Liberated Learner and an ebook of one's own. So I'll go on to Liberate Learner. All right. So this project came out of, um, it was in the midst of the pandemic, uh, a, an organization in Ontario called eCampus Ontario. And I think I saw someone from eCampus Ontario in the, in the participants. Um, thank you. There was a bunch of funding that was released for VLS projects, virtual learning strategy projects for us to across the uh, um, college, university and indigenous institute sector in Ontario. We were given funding for projects to help uh, raise the bar of kind of digital fluency, digital learning skill in Ontario. And I had actually been seconded to eCampus Ontario a couple of years before. And while I was there, I worked on a project called Ontario Extend, which is a uh, digital pedagogy. Um, it's kind of, it's a micro credential on how to kind of teach in a digital age, uh, and it had these buckets. If you see the four I have there, learner, technologist, collaborator, navigator. The original Extend had six: learner, technologist, collaborator, curator, um, scholar an experimenter. And so the idea was like, you have these six areas that if you were competent or more in all these areas, you would be a really well-rounded, prepared for kind of anything uh, teacher, in an educator in a digital age. Like you would probably think, oh, I'm good at this area, but maybe not so good at that. So each one was badged and together it became a micro-credential. So at the time, the thought was, this is awesome. We should do it for students too, but we just didn't have the opportunity until later that VLS funding came out. We thought this is our chance. Let's make it the same thing, but for students. And we, um, uh, it was kind of cart before the horse where the, the call for proposal said you should have four modules. So we're like, okay, four is fine. So we, instead of those six before we uh, aligned it into four modules called learner, technologist, collaborator, navigator. And what was very, I think, beneficial about uh, press books as the, what we chose to actually build in was its uh, ease at which we could collaborate across institutions. Um, everybody had access to everything, but everybody had their space to work. We created, there were seven institutions in Ontario involved, and we kind of had them partner up to, to work on one of these modules each, and we checked in with each other to make sure it was, uh, you know, all in alignment. But the, the ability for everybody to kind of work side by side in, in press books was very beneficial. So you could kind of match the style and, and the tone and, and everything. Um, so uh, one of the one of the huge benefits, I think, of the original Extend was that they got um, the right person for the job to, to create the specific module. So the best person they had at curating worked on the curator module, the best instructional designer worked on the technologist module or whatever. Um, and, and so what came of that, I think most beneficially were 
activities for learners to do that were like, you know, non-disposable, um, authentic work. So you would actually create a visual syllabus or something very useful that you would use later in your actual work. So we aim to do that as well with this, getting students to do projects that truly help them, in, not just to get them a credential badge or whatever, but to, um, you know, help them better with time management or or whatever. There's lots of stuff in there. And the, the third bullet point there, heavy student co-design, we really wanted to get as much of the funding into student pockets as possible. And we really wanted it to mimic the original, as in we had the, the very people who would benefit from the project create the project, uh, the best people. So we got students to tell us their stories of their wicked problems that they face and how they overcame them. And that is what fed the, um, the, 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 the curriculum, the activities and everything. And we also had each of these project teams had student co-instructional designers who helped to create it. And that I think, especially the stories that students told, not only fed the curriculum, fed the content, sorry, they also were the stories that we told at the beginning of the module to get people, you know, hooked on, on what, what they might get out of it. And um, that was very powerful, I think. And uh, the stories are great. I have a, there's a separate website that has just the stories of the wicked problems that I'll share uh, when I stop sharing the screen here. Um, the last, second last bullet point there, lots of complimentary H5P. H5P is another tool I'm sure most of you are aware of, but it's a little thing to create interactive code that you can embed onto pages. And it it's, works very well with Pressbooks. You can pull the H5P file right in and, and, and embed it in any page. And every every module team used made like just fantastic use of, of all kinds of various H5P. Um, like for example, the most boring named one is actually, I think the most exciting. The documentation tool was used to allow students to create, I can't remember exactly in the navigator module, like a, a timeline or a, a weekly schedule that it would output the actual file for you to keep in the H5P, which is pretty cool. Uh, we also used at the beginning of the uh, uh, the project a, a H5P called the branching scenario, which was called the takeout menu, which allowed people to come and just find the thing in there that they want instead of doing the whole project, which was a very uh, helpful tool. And then that last point, I think I'm probably talking too long and I'll get on to the next project. But the last point was kind of the most fun because we were getting Ontario students to tell their stories and to create a, uh, mo uh, some modules for themselves we took advantage of this music program at one of the colleges working with us to create lo-fi chill beats to study to for themselves. So we have this uh, like one hour long playlist of bespoke beats to study to that created for um, the very people that do it. And that was pretty fun part of it. All right, so then after that, and actually because we made good use of Pressbooks for the Liberated Learner and actually like eight other of those VLS projects at Trent um, also use Pressbooks. You know, a couple of years later or maybe a year later, Press, uh, eCampus Ontario was looking at their, their usage and saw Trent was making good use of Pressbooks. So they called us up and said, hey, we want to pilot uh, a single sign-on option with Pressbooks. Do you want it? And we're like, of course, give us, give us, give us. Yes, please. And that got the juices flowing of, well, now that we have access to this, any student could have their own ebook, any faculty, any student. Why not? I always love, love, love the, the practice of domain of one's own. But I think it's often too high a bar kind of digital fluency wise for many students to get going. Kind of back to that idea that it's simplified for you because it's a linear book format. Um, I thought... Domain of one's own could be simplified into an ebook of one's own using press books. And hey, we might get some really cool uh, books of students' learning journey at Trent. Um, let's try it. So we worked on two things a template, which is basically a, uh, a pre crafted ebook of one's own 
book that has just places for you to fill in the blanks to get started that you can then clone and then go on your way. And then also to go with that, a micro credential that walks you through how to do it and why you might want to do it <laughs> and, and how to do some goal setting and how to do your reflecting and how to, you know, stuff. And then even kind of uh, more to link these two projects together, there's one part of this ebook e one's own micro credential that is showing students how to respond to assignments in a more universal design for learning way, you know, multiple means of representation and expression um, to how to how to make an infographic, how to make a podcast and how to make a video. So we brought the modules from Liberated Learner right into the micro credential for ebook on zone, which was, I think, helpful. Um, and yeah, so the template ebook to copy is given a CC zero public domain. You're free to do anything, no attribution necessary. And that just lets you do whatever you want with it. And then the actual LMS cartridge, we're polishing up. We, we have it running at Trent now just for Trent students, but we're going to polish up the cartridge and offer that out as CC BY for, for institutions to bring it in to their uh, LMS and offer it there too. So the idea is of this micro-credential, typically they're most often probably revenue generating, but this is a value add micro-credential for students at Trent and other institutions that want to offer it as in trying to get more value out of your time by documenting your journey, having one place for your reflections and your goal setting, and maybe leave there with something you know, a book that you hug because it's yours, and it, it's your journey. So there's already a few coming in on uh, the place where we're sharing them out. And, and there's kind of really exciting so far what's coming from there, which is awesome. And in, uh, the last two points there um, is that Pressbooks itself, their directory, they're going to create an ebook of one's own category and collection page. So other institutions and Trent if they're sharing them out, they'll they'll all be collected there, which is very cool. And then the final point is just that there's a, a journal from Otessa, the Open and Technology Education Scholarship Society Association article is about to be published by, by us at Trent Online and the Center for Teaching and Learning. So I'll share that out when it comes. And I think, I hope I didn't go too long. That's my story for now. I'll stop sharing. Thanks, everybody. I will mute. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> um, there's lots of, of fantastic questions in the chat that I think we'll get to after our second presentation. Um, but thank you so much for that. That work is so exciting and um, I think inspiring for a lot of us. So thanks for sharing that, that open education journey with us. Um, and now we're going to toss it over to Michelle and Paul. Thanks to you both. Thank you, Terry. That was awesome. Uh, I am Terry, going to okay. share. It looks like Terry might be still yeah. pinned. Liz, can you pin Michelle and Paul? We really you like don't want to stare at, at me the whole time. No, we do. <laughs> All right. So hold on. Here's my very busy screen. All right. Can everyone see that? Yep, excellent. Okay. Hello, I'm Michelle Turnbull. I'm currently a professor of English at Bergen Community College here in New Jersey, but I've worked with Paul and Ryan for many years at Kingsborough. And we are so happy to be here with you guys presenting our project in CUNY Manifold. We always focus on creating this idea of creating community while we were building our early college humanities OER, um, but we, we are going to focus mainly on the benefits of Manifold. Uh, I'm Paul Ricciardi. I'm a professor of theater arts at Kingsborough Community College, part of the City University of New York in Brooklyn. I'm a colleague of Ryan's. Um, and I'm also a course coordinator with the College Now program, which is uh, a program at Kingsborough that brings uh, college level courses to high schools throughout Brooklyn and Staten Island. And um, I am the course coordinator for a humanities course and Michelle is the former co-coordinator. Co and so uh, we're going to show you this um, uh, OER that we developed for the course. 
uh, that now is living on Manifold. And uh, I think we want to start, not working, there we go, uh, with a quick conversation about the why. So I'll do that. I, mean, I should say, we're going to spend a little bit of time sort of giving some context to the project about sort of how it came to be, this humanities OER, and then that'll lead into a conversation about Manifold, which is why you're here today. Um, but just a bit of background. So as I said before, this course uh, is a, a college level course that high school students take throughout Brooklyn and Staten Island in 2020 when COVID hit. Um, these college students, like many college students at that time, were using a very thick, large, expensive <laughs> humanities textbook. Uh, and the books were at the school and they, our students were at home. And so Michelle and I, part of our job as coordinators is to, um, is to support the faculty members that are working throughout Brooklyn and Staten Island who are teaching this humanities course. And so it took a little bit, but you know, we, we kind of limped for a semester and then you know, Michelle and I had both heard of um, the benefits of OER. We knew about OERs, we'd never really thought of making one. Uh, but after a couple of false starts and talking with the um, OER support network uh, on our campus, um, when we had this lack of, of a textbook, we decided um, that we would go out on our own and try and develop this. And we'll talk more about the benefits. You all know the benefits of OERs, but something that's been um, a great surprise to us um, is how these students who are taking a college class but are in high school, how using the OER has been a way to prepare them for college beyond the fact that they're taking a college course. And we'll talk more about that later. Yeah, so our process, you know, we do have an OER coordinator at Kingsborough, which is, you know, a huge benefit. So she had grant money for course conversions into OER. And if anyone has ever converted a course into OER, you know that is a huge undertaking, especially for our course. It's such a unique course that covers, you know, modern humanities, everything from 1900 to present day. So we enlisted the help of the teachers who are actually teaching the course, which um, are actually New York City Department of Ed high school teachers who are hired as adjuncts at Kingsboro. So it was really a collaboration between uh, the OER people at Kingsboro teaching us all about it and then Paul and I kind of leading, guiding the ship with the um, faculty who teach the course. So I think Michelle was late in the spring semester of 2020, we got this grant that Michelle just mentioned um, to support Michelle and I in uh, developing an OER that would become the reader for this humanities course. As Michelle said, it's it's you know it's looking at the humanities throughout, you know uh, the the you know for the past 124 years, and it's really looking at how the humanities impacts our culture. So how you know current events are inspiring and impacting the arts and uh, vice versa, how you know, the arts are responding to that. And we're surveying that through you know, 1900 forward. So everything looking from visual art, poetry, theater, all of it. So we have a large faculty. And when Michelle and I got this funding, on impulse, we decided to reach out to the humanities faculty. We got a group of four or five faculty members who wanted to help. And so we delegated and um, got faculty members to each take on a couple uh, uh, areas of study within the humanities course. So some were looking at, you know, sort of uh, the protest movement in the 60s and the dawn of queer rights and Stonewall. And others were looking at, you know, um, um, modern art and the birth of all of that. And so each faculty member took four or five areas and began researching for open uh, material um, that we could then collect to create this, this reader. Um, one of the greatest challenges was making sure that these things were actually open. And um, Michelle and I, we sort of served as the editor and collector of all of this. We collected all of the material. We would fill the gaps if there was material that seemed to be missing. We spent a summer double checking citations, making sure these uh, items were actually open. Um, adding alt text to every adding single text. image. 
<laughs> yeah. So it was a long process and it's been ongoing. We'll talk more about the process in a moment when we get to Manifold. So when we first created it, it just lived as a PDF in CUNY Academic Works, which is also great. And um, you can see it's been downloaded over a thousand times all across the world. They are just loving us in the Philippines. But this, I just love to show like how our little one text is making such an impact, you know, not just in Kingsborough Community College, which is who we made it for. And um, then um, I know they're going to share this slideshow with you. So we yeah. wanted you to have the link to our project in Manifold so that you can check it out. You know, you can access it. You can use it in your own classrooms or just read it for fun. For fun. <laughs> Okay, and, so now we're at the benefits. Yes, yeah, so lots of benefits to why we went from a PDF into Manifold. Uh, Manifold really worked for us because students are able to interact with the text in a more dynamic way. Paul's going to talk to you in a moment about how you can create reading groups and students and teachers can use these reading groups and annotation features. Um, then I'll show you very quickly the admin page, how easy it is on the back end to create this Manifold. Um, our favorite thing about it is this um, ability to add resources that are not necessarily OER, but they can be PowerPoints, videos, audio clips, pictures, anything else that you want to include in your OER text. Um, obviously, another good thing about any OER is the ability to update, add, or change content based on your students' needs. And of course, the the what I think is one of the main benefits of Manifold is the accessibility because we used um, styles and headings in our Word document before uploading it in Manifold. It's really perfect for any student or any person that has an e-reader because it's going to label the headings and the subheadings and the, the picture captions and the alt text. So it really is... Um, really great for accessibility. And I mean, I just want to reinforce something that Michelle just said, you know, it's something we've uh, discovered, I mean, we kind of knew this was true, but it was reinforced when we were talking to um, faculty members, teachers who are teaching K through 12. Um, there isn't a lot of conversation about the benefits and use of Manifold, uh, Manifold or OER in, you know, K through 12 because this college class is actually living in high schools and being it's the OERs are OERs being used by high school students we've started learning about just how important it is to have a text that is dynamic because the needs of the student groups are constantly changing in the old days there would be this you know addition and then we'd have to wait for the next edition to to come out we have updated this OER now at least three times just add and we're, we're constantly adding and moving things around so it's really been a huge benefit um so now this is um our home page i'm showing you so this is when you go to our home page for our oer this is showing you how it's laid out uh, there's a table of contents and then it goes chapter by chapter you can click on any one of these links what is so great about uh using manifold is that the student, the user can access this information in a number of ways. So for example, here you see resources. These are collections that we will talk about later of resources that we have organized with our faculty for each unit within this reader. So these uh, items are embedded in the text as you're reading, but we also have them sort of collected on the landing page and on the landing page of each chapter. So there are many ways students can um, access this information. Oh, oh, this is exact. Hold on. There we go. Okay. So now what we want to do is talk about our favorite, one of our favorite parts of um, the functionality within Manifold, which is the uh, ability to annotate. So this, um, these instructions are here for you for later. So for those of you that aren't very familiar with M Manifold, you will get a copy of the slide deck and um, they will, so this will guide you through it. So, um, okay, let's go through. So now I'm taking you step-by-step step through, just forgive this first screen, I was having technical difficulties. All right, so here we are uh, in Manifold. I'm logging in as you know a Manifold user. And then uh, once I'm in the login page, I am going to get rid of that. 
And uh, you can find this project many ways. Just I just uh, used the search and entered our project, Humanities, and there We're it is. So a our featured project. project. We are featured. <laughs> And then you go to reading groups uh, and my reading groups, I've created a reading group for this text. Now this is important because um, when you create a reading group, so let's say you have a class and you have, you wanna use a uh, manifold for the, your OER for your class, you can have a reading group for each class that is private for uh, each class. So here you'll see me uh, highlighting a piece of text highlighting a piece of text, and then uh, I can annotate that. And you all know if you're teaching several sections of class, different classes might be at different levels, so you, the annotation might not be the same. So now I'm talking directly to my students, and I'm asking them a question about a particular passage within the reader. And this is something that only the students within that reading group will see, so I'm in direct dialogue with them. This is sort of something you might do on a discussion board within Brightspace or Blackboard or your Google Classroom. Um, but this is right within the text. So then I've posted my question and now I'm behaving like a student and a student can reply to me right there and answer the question. So it's a really exciting and dynamic way um, to, to use the annotation within um, Manifold. We, we love it. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly, I just wanted to show you the back end of Manifold, uh, which we call admin mode, just because Paul, Paul and I have this motto, if we can do it, you can do it. So I just wanted to show you how easy it is to create something in Manifold, right? On the sidebar, um, they have all these great um, things for us. They have analytics where you can see how many unique visitors you have, how many people are interacting with your text, how many reading groups you have, how many people have annotated your text. Um, so there's a lot of information that they give you um, on this uh, analytics page. Um, and then you can see they give you the properties, the layout, how to add the resources. This is all what um, the back end looks like as you are creating your text. Pain, it's it's really user friendly. You know, something that um, Terry was saying earlier, we were you know the, the different kinds of liberated learners is that thing about the technologist. <laughs> you know, I think there's like a lot of us that you know I'll speak for myself that kind of live in terror of technology sometimes. <laughs> and so, um, what has been so great about Manifold is that it is really, really, really um, intuitive. So, um, you know, so much of, I mean, we, we've, CUNY is extremely supportive and there, there's a whole staff at CUNY. I mentioned Robin Miller before. Uh, she's an OER technologist at CUNY and she's in the Graduate Center and she's helped us tremendously, but it really is um, a very intuitive platform. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, why isn't this going? Oh, hold on. All right, so now I think this is me. Yes, this is me. All right, so now we're just, this is just giving you an idea of um, what a chapter looks like. So now we're on the landing page of chapter one, the birth of modernism. Um, a couple of things that we do, uh, Michelle and I wrote um, uh, this, created documents for each chapter in the reader called Things to Consider. So it's a resource. And um, it's us talking directly to uh, not only the faculty, but the students. One of the things that uh, the humanities course celebrates and encourages is, is group work. So this class is taught like a seminar. So almost all of our faculty are breaking the students up into groups. Um, and so this resources, um, things to consider resource is a way to support this activity. There are a lot of discussion questions and so forth. Uh, so yeah, so the resources are on a landing page, but one of our other favorite things about Manifold, because as if there's not a million, is how the resources can be embedded into the chapter, right? So if you're the teacher, you can put some PowerPoints or some lessons or some videos in there. And then if you're the student, you can see on the side as you're reading, oh, there's a little resource, let me click on that. And this links you to a PowerPoint that a teacher created that she might want you to look at while you're reading that goes side by side with the chapter, right? 
right? And again, resources can be PowerPoints, videos, handouts, audios, clips, images, and they are just right there. And students and teachers can toggle back and forth and you have everything in one place, right? And you're not losing your spot in the reading. So it's just another way for students to be interacting with the content in there, right? So it's kind of amazing, um, the embedded resource feature. And we're constantly updating it. So for example, this PowerPoint was created by one of our faculty members. Mm -hmm. um, so we're constantly adding and changing uh, resources. Yeah, and I show you my favorite one, right? If the student is reading this chapter about Stravinsky, right? It's you can't teach a student about Stravinsky. They have to see it, right? So it just links them to this video where they can watch the Rite of Spring Ballet. And it just gives them a, more context to what they're reading. And again, they're just toggling back and forth. It just gives them a better um, perspective. It helps with their understanding. Oh, did it again. I love it. So now, um, just going back to the resource collection. So what Michelle is just showing you, uh, within a particular chapter, there are resources embedded throughout. So while they're reading, they can you know click on a thing and actually see a ballet. Um, and this is throughout the entire reader. And so uh, a user can access the, these uh, resources in the text, or let's say, you know, you're teaching the course and later on you want to come back in and grab it quickly, but you don't need to read. You can go to the landing page. All of the resources are kept there. And then they're also organized in addition to being embedded within the text. They're collected at the end of each chapter as well. So it's really user friendly. And this is not something that Mich Michelle and I organized. It, do it defaults that for you. I mean, we had to upload the resources ourselves, but once they're there, Manifold organizes it in all these different sorts of ways with the idea that a user is only one click away from something they need. Stop it. I'm sorry, I keep there. Um, so we're almost out of time. I just wanted to say a little bit about where this project is going next with Manifold. Um, I mean, the, so the the piece itself, we're planning on uh, creating a chapter five that might be related to modern issues. And then we also want to create a section that uh, is a collection of student work. Uh, there's some really extraordinary student work. We have one faculty member um, who uh, is a visual artist and she, uh, as a unit, creates protest art with her students. And so we want to create a chapter that showcases student work. Um, Michelle and I are in the process of writing an article that uh, is sort of like a celebration of collaboration, but also a you can do it too, how to um, article. So we'll be talking about how we created our article um, and hopefully uh, we'll finish it this year and you'll see more about it. Um, yeah, and so we thank you so much. And of course, if you have any questions, we also just included our emails. We don't get your questions today, but we are happy to help you in any way that we can. And we appreciate yeah. your time. We're really grateful. Thank you to Open Education Global, to CCC OER. Um, we're really happy to be here and look forward to getting your questions. Thanks, Paul and Michelle. Um, Unpinning you. There we go. Um, I have <clears throat> I have some announcements, but I think I'm gonna hold on those until like the last five minutes of uh, the webinar, so that we can just trans transition into some questions. We have some in the chat. Um, but also feel free to raise a hand. Um, I'm gonna try and scroll back up and see some of these questions from before. Um, Terry, there was a question about some of the functionality of Pressbooks. And I don't know if you had a response to Kelly's question about some of the issues that they were having. Um, I think I replied to that one as being you should talk to Pressbooks themselves. I'm sure yeah. they'll help, but I, I, yeah, I, you're out of my jurisdiction there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> great. Um, 
Paul and Michelle, there was two questions in the chat um, about uh, how long things stay on Manifold. And oh, sort of forever. And, oh, and using Manifold in the LMS. So yes, go, go, go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, I think, oh, you know, it's, they're going to stay there. And all we do is really just keep adding to, adding to it. Like, I don't see us ever going in and like taking things out. We've just been kind of adding it, but they are there embedded in the text and, and permanent, I guess. And the LMS, that's a good question. Like, I guess, um, right. What would you do? Just kind of link make, I would make it my textbook, right? Like this is the required text. Um, and then it's free for students to make their accounts, right? Their CUNY Manifold accounts. So anyone can make an account on that website, right? And yes, and <laughs> um, you, this is might be a question for you, Ryan. So if I'm a non-CUNY member, anyone can use Manifold, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for example, I, it's, it's- I mean, with different, um, at different levels. Yeah. So anyone can access- Anyone can access and use any of the OERs that are published on Manifold. You can create a Manifold account. You can use it in your classrooms. You can create reading groups with your students. All of that is open and, and open access and freely available. The CUNY instance of Manifold, similar to like instances of Pressbooks, the CUNY instance of Manifold, only CUNY faculty can create projects on that instance. There is an asterisk there that it could be a collaborative project and you might just be partnering with a CUNY faculty member and everybody else on the team might be from other colleges and universities. As long as you have one partner member from a CUNY institution, they can um, create the account that would, that would be creating the OER. Um, so that's sort of access the access question, but I, I agree with Michelle. I think what a lot of faculty do is they simply use, they basically link in the LMS to um, the OER. Um, I'll also just say, um, you can bring Manifold to your institution. Manifold itself is an openly licensed platform. It's not exactly like the, it's not like you just sort of download it to your computer and then it's available. It's it's a bit of an undertaking, but um, I'm putting in the chat, um, just play the, sort of the about page on Manifold where you can learn more about the uh, platform itself and the various institutions that are using it. Because Ryan, maybe, you know, there there's no cost if you want to get your institution to use it. Right. It's it's usually just the cost for like the server space and sort of the the technology required to support the platform itself, but the actual um, nuts and bolts of Manifold is is really available. Um, okay, other questions. I'm sorry, I'm talking and I need to be looking at the at the chat. What happens to Manifold resources if the author's institution account lapses? Nothing happens. So the so the uh, I see what you're saying. Nothing. So the the uh, let's say we collaborate with you or or you created an, a, a a resource we wanted to use. Once it's embedded. Um, I mean, unless somehow it was, it was taken off the internet, it would still be there. And in many cases we are, I mean, we're using links, but sometimes we're also using um, documents that are PDFs that we're then embedding in it. But I mean, I would suppose if like you, there was a video on YouTube that someone had designed and eventually that became dead, then that would be a problem. But we're pretty regularly well, looking into that. And most of the videos I um, are just downloads that have been, then been uploaded. So there's they're not like on actual YouTube. Um, there's a question. Do you have resources? I think this is uh, a manifold question. Do you have resources in different disciplines, say mathematics? Well, for, I'm sorry, on CUNY Manifold, you can search for any text. Like um, 
in my English classroom, I might not be using our humanities textbook, but you can search for other texts that are in Manifold and those are also uh, free to use and, and available. So I'm sure they have, Who, Paul, was it that on Manifold where they had the science labs? Oh yeah, they use, yeah. It was Manifold, right? Yeah, I mean, so if you go, I mean, to any you can just just for fun, you can go to the the uh, CUNY instance of Manifold just because it's the one I'm Michelle and I are familiar with, but there's definitely all disciplines there, all of them. I mean, Michelle and I created this humanities reader, but there's all sorts of resources there, and we actually Ryan and I have colleagues at Kingsbro who've created. Um, actually, I don't know if it's on Manifold, but, you know, science workbooks and uh, other things related to mathematics for sure. And Paul and Michelle are sort of featuring what would be a replacement for, you know, a traditional textbook. But there's all sorts of things on Manifold. There's like open syllabi and, and sort of um, folders of resources that might be useful for a given course. So you can you can search by discipline. Um, Terry Kimberly is asking, what kind of support does your institution provide to students around licensing, publishing, and accessibility for the press books for students? Yeah, um, so in the micro-credential that goes with it, it walks you through all that stuff, tells you uh, gives you some ideas of how to, uh, which license to choose, um, how to publish it, and uh, there's an accessibility check at the end for everybody to learn how to do that. I have yeah, I, I haven't had a chance to release the uh, the LMS cartridge openly yet, so it's a potential OER. It will be, but it's not yet forthcoming. Stay tuned. Yeah. Um, great, thank you. Uh, Teresa is asking, it looks like Manifold allows a lot of content type resources. What about formative assessment options? Is there a possibility of creating practice questions or interactives like H5P that offer feedback on student practices? Yeah, so I think you have a couple of different options, right? You could upload any formative assessment at like the end of the chapter as like a kind of handout, if you will, you know, for the students to complete. Or I think what Paul was showing, right, you can easily use the annotation tool and grade that as, as a formative assessment. If that's helpful. And there is, I'm I'm less, I'm like a manifold novice compared to Michelle and Paul. Um, it does interface with H5P. So if it is something, Teresa, if you're more familiar with H5P and you, you know how to create resources in that, I know manifold does interface with H5P. I'm, I'm just not familiar with it. Um, so if that's something that you feel like you could do, it would be supported in manifold. Of that because I I have come across many of those tutorials on how to use H5P and Manifold. Um, so it is it is possible. Someone has a question about can I farm my OER to Manifold that I created a different platform? Yes and no. So it's not, I mean, it's so this was an adventure that Michelle and I had to go through. So we are are this the humanities um OER before we went to Manifold lived as a PDF. It was, just, here you go, PDF. And so we did, to make it fully accessible and fully readable, um, excuse me, so someone who might need an e-reader um, uh, while using it, we had to reformat all of it. So the good news was it was easy. It was, we we did, uh, we, we um, did we go from um, Google don't to use, Word? Don't use Google Docs. That's My it. advice right. is yeah. Word, Word, yeah. Word, and you have to use a style with all the headings and the subheadings yeah. and the captions and yeah. the citations. They all have to be in their style. So it was a lot of formatting. But if if you've done any, it's Kingsborough's is, has been um, been great over the past couple of years in supporting faculty and making sure that all of our resources are completely accessible. 
So if you've done any work at all on making sure that the documents you're using on Brightspace or Blackboard are accessible, you know, and like Michelle said, that's just in how you're laying out your document, making sure you're using headings and subheadings and things like that, then this won't feel unfamiliar to you. And if you've never had to do that, it wasn't, it was just work. <laughs> we had to reformat it. So then once we reformatted it, it was literally just a, a um, um, it wasn't literally this, but it felt very, it was just, you know, we just dumped it in, but we did have to reformat. And I don't know if harvest was the right word or not, but I kind of intuited what you were saying, Margaret. <laughs> Barry, did you come about using Pressbooks because Trent got their own instance of Pressbooks? Is that sort of what nope. happened in terms of uh, in terms of choosing that platform? No, my first um, experience with it was basically here's the advice: if Robin DeRosa does something, copy her. And she created that open, open anthology of earlier American literature, which was like the original epic um, co-creation uh, thing that, that I borrowed that idea for the open faculty patch book and just ran from there. So that's where I learned about press books. I plugged it in the chat, but I can't say enough about the open faculty patch book. It was like, it was one of my, like, for, when I first started dabbling in OER, it was one of the first things that I discovered. And it was like, it was kind of like a roadmap for me during the pandemic of like how I wanted to use OER in my classes. So I, if, if folks are not familiar with it, it's like, you could read one a day. They're just, they're just great stories. Yeah, the people that contributed did awesome. And it was fully like, the idea came fully from Robin DeRosa, just switched the kind of topic and it, it worked well. I also made an op open learner patch book as well. Um, and that, that never got moved into um, press books, but I just didn't ever get the time, but that was fun to, to as well to collect those stories, which is very similar to the wicked problem stories we collected for the, um, I should grab that website. I forgot to get that link for the liberated learner. Yes, please put that in the chat. Um, any other questions from anyone that we can answer, clarify, expand upon? Feel free to put in the chat or unmute. We're almost at time, but we might have time for one more. Pull up my slides and start my closing spiel. Oh, hi, Joseph. Hi, I've got a quick follow up question about the uh, uh, press books versus Manifold. My institution is just about to enter into a contract with Manifold starting July 1st. I, what, sorry, with, with press books. Start, <laughs> that's that's, that's going to be the, uh, the, uh, the official adopted one. And I've been, you know, dabbling at the edges of Manifold for a while now. And I'm wondering, you know, what are, are there other considerations as far as like, you know, doing that either on your own or asking the institution to put Manifold in? alongside press books or is that something where you're stepping on uh, small toes with big boots or any any addresses to that i mean michelle and paul feel free to add to this but around the time that that i was the open education coordinator at kingsborough and and michelle and paul were in the heart of their work cuny also got their own instance of press books so they have they have an instance of that, and I think Manifold, because it is uh, a CUNY-created platform. Um, I, from my experience, getting assistance for the for Manifold is super easy for us on the inside because, because Robin is at the Grad Center. We have like an in-house educational technologist that knows the platform really, really well. Um, I know Pressbooks also has a support team, but I think for for us that have worked in it, that was that was a big thing. Michelle and Paul, is that is that accurate? Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would also say, and I don't, I've never used Pressbooks, but 
my impulse, like what seems really exciting to me, like this idea of making, you know, it's, you know, a resource of one's own, like I could definitely, I, I see down the road, our faculty working with their students to create a press book of their work that they created in the class. So I think also the functionality might be a little different. I mean, I really, I, I'm, you know, I don't know, I don't know press books, but they seem like they're doing two different things. <clears throat> and Lauren Ray just put in the in the chat at our institution, we created a manifold and press books. What's the difference guide here? That is so awesome, Lauren. Um, this has been helpful in talking with faculty about which platform may be best for their project. What an incredible resource. Um, I'm so excited to look through that. We're going to put that on our CTL webpage, Lauren. Thanks so much. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to share my screen real quickly and just talk through these final announcements for all of you. So this is our last uh, webinar of the spring season, spring term, spring semester. I want to thank all of our presenters this semester, um, especially Michelle, Paul, and Terry who joined us today as well as the entire CCC OER Professional Development Committee who helped plan those webinars. Um, we have archived webinars on our website and the new webinars for the fall semester will be announced in August. Also this summer, if you are um, interested, CCC OER hosts an EDI Summer Book Club. Um, the full announcement is there and maybe uh, Liz can put these links in the chat for us. There's an ebook available as well. And there are the meeting dates. Uh, these slides will be shared and you can have those meeting dates if you can't write them down now. Um, and the book is Academic Ableism by J. Timothy Dolmage, Disability in Higher Education. Um, we'd love to hear from you about, about today's webinar and ideas for future webinars. Um, the Professional Development Committee gets together a few times every year to really think deeply and intentionally about um, what sorts of topics would be most useful to the CCC OER community. So we'd love to hear about um, how you feel about today's webinar and things that we can do.